Hey guys, in this video I'm going to be playing some clips from a debate review discussion I had with Charles from the Layman's Seminary YouTube channel about a week ago. Um, Charles debated Sean Griffin from the YouTube channel called Kingdom in Context. Uh, the debate topic was whether or not free grace theology is biblical. I posted a link to that full debate in the description of this video. Uh, in that debate, Charles presented a lesser known alternative free grace view of the atonement. So I'm going to first I'm going to play that part of the debate from his intro where he goes over the views and then after that I'm going to be playing clips from our after show discussion. Um, as you'll see I'm still freshly processing his views and so I ask him some more questions about the position and we talk about how that affects other doctrines and interpretations of the Bible. The main purpose of making this video is to bring more awareness to this atonement view. Uh, we both want this view challenge to see if it holds under scrutiny, especially as Charles continues to do more formal debates defending free grace. Um, I hope this video is edifying. Let me know your guys' thoughts in the comment section down below. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, thanks for watching and God bless. But the real issue is that Sean believes individual sins will cause you to lose salvation. But pay attention to my assertion in this debate. No one goes to hell because of individual sins. In other words, this is about how one views the atonement. I can't untangle all of Sean's views, but I can pull on the string and trust God to unravel the rest. So there are two views of atonement within free grace. One of them is Christ's death is only applied to those who believe. The other one is Christ's death removes the barrier for the whole world. The second one is what I'm presenting here. If it's correct, it shows that no one goes to hell because of sin. This does not lead to universalism because only those that believe receive Christ's imputed righteousness and eternal life. And it explains this view of atonement encounters the other ones. So uh, I'm depending on Sean Lazar in certain areas here. He developed an idea that was developed by Lewis Bray Schaefer, founder, founder of Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, but moving forward. So whenever you're talking about Calvinism or Arminianism, they both have one benefit that's limited either to the elect or to uh, those that believe, okay, versus the manifold benefit. Now, that's a generalization, but I'm going to work with it for right now. So one benefit is the removal of the barrel. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. That's a legal benefit. Then there's a life benefit that in John 3, 16, if you believe, you receive eternal life. And then there's the benefit for the believer through cleansing and confession of 1 John 1, 9. If we walk in the light, it sees in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all righteousness. When you look at the Old Testament sacrifices, which I do not believe they're for salvation, we see that there's multiple benefits there. So when you're looking at these atonement passages, think about benefit, beneficiary, and condition. Because remember what I'm saying, nobody goes to hell because of individual sins, because Jesus Christ removed the barrier. So even unbelievers do not go to hell because of their individual sins. Now, the reason they go to hell is not because of it's a judicial uh, judgment. It's rather because there's no place for them to go. And I'll explain this in more detail. See, when we're talking about the atonement, it's not that Jesus died for some sins of all men. Some people have this view that there's certain sins that Jesus didn't die for. Either he died for all sins or only some. Uh, the other, This is also not the view that Jesus died for all sins of some men, as some Calvinists typically view it. J rather, Jesus died for all the sins of all men. See, hell is a natural consequence, not a judicial punishment. In other words, if we talk about the illustration of a drug dealer who's killed while dealing drugs or in a, in a shootout or something, that's a natural consequence that he reaped. Whereas if a drug dealer is killed for committing a murder, that's a judicial consequence. As I said, this goes back to Lewis Perry Schaefer, and this is uh, articulated by Lazar. But the point is, is that some of the other benefits that include within the atonement is uh, free from traditions as a formal way of life. And so that has an implication for legalism. Can I ask about the your atonement view? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so your view is that sins, individual sins don't send you to hell, right? And you, right. you're saying that that's already been dealt with. So everyone's sins have already been covered, whether or not you believe in Christ, right? Right, right. So does that, how does that, because I've always been taught that, you know, we kind of use the law and that Paul uses the law, like in Romans, to get people to see their need for a savior. 
Yeah, I think those passages are taken out of context. So a is lot that of whole idea not it's not actually in scripture as far as using the law to to convict people of sin and that they need a savior. There's a few passages where it it might be a possibility, like maybe at Thessalonians, I think it is, but uh I don't recommend it because what you win them with is what you win them to. So if you use the law in 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 for example, way of master evangelism. If you're pointing out that you break this commandment or whatever, they're going to think, well, if I if you convicted me of my need for salvation by bringing up the commandments, then it makes sense that I got to keep the commandments either to maintain or prove that I'm saved. So it just and when you take that approach, you set people up for failure because the false teachers are going to come right behind and they're going to. Uh, teach uh, something wrong you know so what's going on in romans then with using you know talking about the law and how we're all going to be you know everyone's going to be no one can escape the judgment of god and then because of that you need christ and that's where it gets into you know oh what i'm thinking is positional salvation in romans 3 talking about the gift and it, on the romans 4 it, so yeah that's not, is, go ahead that, that's a lutheran uh from the reformation interpretation of romans and i understand why martin luther saw that because he was like oh, justification of my faith he thought everything was positional but uh i take the view currently that romans is talking about temporal wrath that was the view of zane hodges so if it's if the warning or the indictment involves temporal wrath then it's not talking about how to be safe from hell so what's it's, going on with the, do you believe like Romans three about the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ? Is that positional? Or is that's that positional that's a Romans six twenty three. Oh yeah. Thank you. I take it as experiential. I believe that it, for the wages, wages are something that you earn. So for the wages of sin is death. And in that passage at Romans six, it's talking about you're dead to sin. Now count yourself dead to sin. Don't go on presenting yourselves as slaves as masters, but present yourself as slaves of righteousness. And then uh, it, then it goes into describing things, and it says, for the wages of sin is death, meaning that if you, it's basically like a reap what you sow, you get what you put in uh, situation. So eternal life is being used here as something that is not positional. It's rather related to rewards or the quality of life that one has and also the kingdom idea as well. And this corresponds with Romans 2, where it talks about the outcome of basically our perseverance, eternal life. And a lot of people try to say, oh, that's just hypothetical. No, I don't think it's hypothetical. I think eternal life is not positional in that passage. It's either experiential in the walk or I actually in that passage, I would put it in the kingdom. So even Romans 4, is that not? Is that not that's experiential too? Everything going on there, I think so because it's it's talking about Abraham and the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant inheritance and about the how he will inherit the world and uh, all of that language. Uh, the, this involves the issue of interpreting the Old Testament in the New, and there's different ways that the New Testament writer can use the Old Testament as an explanation as an analogy, as an application. There's others that I could pull up. Uh, but so what people try typically do is they will say, well, Genesis 15, 6 is positional, but Romans is using it uh, to draw a principle or application that is positional, okay? But I think Genesis 15 is experiential, and if it's experiential, then why not consider the possibility that every time an Old Testament passage is used, that it's being used the same way it's used in the Old Testament? Now, the challenge to that is people bring up, well, what about John 3.16? And John 3.16 on the conservative approach is I've kept it positional. But it really is possible to take it as experiential. I don't argue that way. But if you think about it, what makes us think never perish means never go to hell? Why are we assuming never perish is referring to hell when perish can be used to refer to ruin or destruction, divine discipline, uh, uh, pr uh, 
death in, in the sense of, uh, you know, what, what's going on there? Uh, it, it could be just some autonomy for uh, divine discipline. Because if you got, I set before you life and death, and the eternal life is referring to life into the ages, which would mean in the kingdom. And so that would be an abundance life. And so the promise is, is that if you want to receive the kingdom, you got to be a believer because everyone that receives the kingdom are believers. Now, that doesn't mean the kingdom is salvation, but it means that one uh, a prerequisite for receiving the kingdom is that one be saved. Because in the tribulation, everybody is believers. And also in Colossians, the way Andy Woods takes it, he takes it as a de facto verse. I mean, a de jure distinction that we've been translated into the kingdom of his son in a de jure way. In other words, judicially or forensically. And but de facto will be when actually we have our glorified bodies and are ruling and reigning. So I, I'm just saying most people don't want to uh, t try to run it consistently as the passages are being used in the Old Testament and New. Um, I'm trying it, and I'm trying to see what explanatory power it has for that because it could be that we made up a whole uh, hermeneutical argument about the use of the Old Testament and the New in order to wrap around our theology. However, there's some good hermeneutic scholars within the camp, or at least dispensational, not necessarily free grace, that uh, Abner Child, for example, hermeneutics of the biblical writers, that does a good job of this. Redownick, there's others, uh, Fruit and Bomb, there's others that have done a good job of dealing with this issue, but it's still largely influenced by non-dispensationalists like Bill and Amillennialists, and they just use typological arguments, and it seems like they're allegorizing everything. So I'm highly skeptic of it, even though I think Child's work and Vlock's work have done a lot to help put us in the right direction. Yeah, Can I ask another helpful because I oh go ahead, Josh. Oh, go, you go said ahead, it, it gets us helpful. Go ahead first. Sorry. Yeah, I because I'm in my current studies, I'm just, I'm flipping back and forth in Romans trying to figure out, you know, cause it is a paradigm shift because I've been, I'm, I've always seen Romans as teaching positional truth with the way with Romans four, you know, how that's being described. But I, but I admit that, you know, I don't believe Gen, I believe Abraham was saved before Genesis 15 that it's referencing. So that always kind of bugged me, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and then, but then Romans six that we talked about earlier does say like the gift of God. And I always thought, you know, salvation, positional salvation is a gift, but it sounds like you're saying that even a reward can be described as a gift there. Yeah, you're, that, that's a good question. Cause you're yeah. working there. So, yeah. So the way I would put it is for the wages of, of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So the thing to understand is that when you talk about salvation, right, if we're talking about the gift, what is the gift? Is salvation only positional salvation or is it uh, position experience and ultimate? And if that be the case, then when the word gift is being used, it could refer to position experience or ultimate or it could refer to all of it. So but we got to determine. How can it refer on. to the experiential as a gift when when the blessings that come from that we need to you know there's conditions for for the believers to experience yeah well jesus jesus said i came that they may have life and life abundantly so yeah. what happens is this is that whenever you are in fellowship with god god gives you the gift of having a rich experience but what you but it's a reward also because not every believer it uh, experiences that in this life. So uh, think of it like this. First off, we need to understand that when we're talking about uh, rewards, we're not talking about uh, one for one correspondence. It's not you do this and I do that. That's not what's going on. So what that means is that even when God rewards, whether it's in time or in eternity, it's abundantly in a bond. You know, the Bible says in uh, Ephesians, God is able to do uh, all the above and beyond all that we ask and think. So he gives, you know, it says, uh, it says, uh, it says, well, how's it say? Give and it should be given unto you. Press down, 
uh, measuring into your bosom and running over. The point is, is that anytime you give to God, whatever it is, God always outgives you. The fact that you're able to walk in the spirit is because he gave you the spirit and he gave you the free will to be able to do it. So you can still call that a gift. I think Taylor brings up a good point. An argument against uh, Romans 6.23 being experiential uh, uh, is that it says gift. But not every gift is salvation. In fact, our spiritual gifts are given at the moment of salvation, but they're not salvation in themselves. So there's other gifts that are mentioned in the Bible. So that's a good point, uh, Taylor. Now, what uh, what a lot of people do is they'll say there's a distinction. The wages of sin is death. And they would say, yeah, that's talking about sanctification. But in contrast to that, but the gift of God is eternal life in, through Jesus Christ. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Why is it focusing on the gift here? And so I think one question to ask is, does John, I mean, does Rome, Paul use gift earlier in the book of Romans? And if he does, does he define it as positional or what's going on? And I think it's in Romans 5. Uh, and then uh, also Romans 3.24, that justified freely by his grace, that could be translated as justified as a gift. So there could be an argument that it's it's con contrast to sanctification and positional. So it could go either way. Uh, and that's what that's all the chart's supposed to do. It's to it's to make you observe more carefully and think about the possibilities in the text and then try to narrow down a probability. It's a Bible study tool. That's all it is. Um does your view of the atonement change like traditional views on imputate receiving Christ's righteousness? No, no. Okay. Cause like, I said, my understanding was like Christ's the, righteousness and eternal life. Cause the, argu the argument I understood was like, well, Jesus, you know, Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. Therefore he, you know, he never sinned. And, and we received that perfect obedience when we believe. Oh, I'm skeptic of that. Okay. Uh, active because... and passive obedience. Yeah, that's covenant theology, I think, influence on that. So now, what's I may going have to... on with receiving Christ's righteousness then? What... I'm, I don't know if Christ's righteousness refers to his righteousness uh, as what he did. I don't think it's saying that Christ even worked for salvation. I don't think it's... Because, in part because the law was never about position salvation. salvation right right Wait, so what is the what is the what is the argument here taylor you're saying that when christ's righteousness is imputed onto you and therefore you should be righteous yeah so my understanding sin? going back to going back to what we were talking about earlier about the relationship between the law and the gospel is that usually people use the law to show people that they need a savior because they use the law as a standard hey you god demands perfection you are not perfect therefore you deserve hell because you go to hell to pay for your sin, right? And so we need a perf someone to fulfill it perfectly. That was Jesus. And when you believe the gospel, you receive, you receive Jesus's righteousness, which is like equating to like keeping the law perfectly. And therefore you have the righteousness needed to go to heaven. That's, that's kind of the flow of the argument. And so I'm asking Charles, since he doesn't think that sin sends you to hell how does that affect or how does he see that as far as receiving christ's righteousness is, do we receive christ's righteousness is it how i explained what's going on there does it matter as far as going to heaven or is that an experiential truth or what's going on you know where's, where's the where's the verse about um i think it's elizabeth um there's there's a lot of verses in the bible in which it it accounts people as being righteous being, being yeah righteous. that's experiential that's experiential righteousness yeah but so was jesus like, was capable of having experiential righteousness you know what i mean so if you could say it like this you could say that jesus fulfilled the law not for salvation but for sanctification and therefore accumulated experiential righteousness as a human 
and that human righteousness was imputed uh, to the cross, that would be an example of active obedience. And then the the, uh, the passive obedience would be what, what he did at the cross. The problem I have with that argument is I don't believe that active obedience was uh, is the base of salvation because what that does is that makes Christ's life part of the atonement instead of the cross just being where atonement occurred. Atonement didn't begin until he became sin on the cross. So what's so did Jesus have to die on the cross in order for us to be able to go to heaven? Yes. And Jesus died on the cross for our sins, right? Yes. It's it's a I would say so, it's a blood covering, right? So when when uh, when God told Moses to take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doors that the angel of death would come and pass over those because they're covered with the blood of the lamb, right? So I, I see it like that. You know, that. I take that as experiential too. So, okay, so if Jesus was, you know, the perfect sacrifice, but in the Old Testament, sacrifices were never about positional salvation. Right, right. Why do we need Jesus' sacrifice to be able to go to heaven? Uh, so why do we need to... Well, the way I would used to argue would be this. I would say the reason uh, that... Animal sacrifices were temporary is because an animal sac an animal can't die in place of a human and it'd be a perfect sacrifice. Okay. So there needed to be a human sacrifice. Okay. Now, Sean, it's interesting you bring this up. Sean doesn't believe that human sacrifices are ever accepted. So he believes that Jesus Christ's death on the cross was not a sacrifice because uh, he just died according to prophecy. That he didn't die as a sacrifice. Because he would say that God would not accept a human sacrifice. Even, even if it was one attributed to to uh, the right God. You know. So that's thrown off. But it makes you think. Because it's like. Why did Jesus Christ have to physically die? Well he had to die as a substitute. But if he's removing the barrier, then that tells us that there was enmity between God and man in some type of way. We're like, well, okay, but well, wait a minute, because people were able to get saved before the cross, and even though this enmity existed. And some people describe it like this: is they got saved on credit, and and because of the because God no, was going to pay the bill uh, uh, at the cross. So that means that everyone in the Old Testament, they just believed the gospel and got saved. And it's on the basis of Christ's death at the cross. That's why Ryrie says the basis of death, the salvation has always been the same. And the basis of death, uh, the basis of salvation has always been the death of Christ on the cross. Yeah, I guess I'm not, I'm, I guess I'm just not understanding why he would need to die on the cross like from your atonement view um, well well why why do they need to be reconciled why because the claim is that the atonement removes a barrier well where did the barrier come from what is the barrier well i thought it was our sin well it, i thought it, our it, sin separate us from god and that's why we need a savior right but see that that's individual personal sin the question is this can you have, I mean, you're asking good questions. Can you have a barrier, uh, a, a, a no reconciliation, if you don't accept federal headship? In other words, do you have to accept that when Adam sinned, it affected the whole human race and put a barrier up? And if the barrier has been put up, was it about salvation? Then that would mean no one could get saved in the Old Testament. So what that means is that the barrier is not salvation. I think one idea to think about in 2 Corinthians is that it's talking about reconciliation. Well, reconciliation is war language. You know, war and peace reconciliation. So maybe what it's talking about is that um, there's other passages. There's In Acts 17, it says, The times of ignorance God winked at, uh, but now commands all men to repent. So that's like he passed over that. Then uh, Romans 
four says that he passed over the sins that were previously committed. So God's describing it as he passed over the time before the cross and then dealt with the sins at the cross, that he might be the just and the justifier. So maybe the maybe the barrier language is not the right language, but basically what maybe what we should say is that Christ removed the judgment. You know, honestly, I don't know. You're right. You're absolutely right. I don't know what language to describe that. Okay. Yeah, Thank I, you, I, I, I So, yeah. Taylor, what? you might have just unraveled Sean Lazar's view of the atonement. Well, the reason we'll, it's we'll coming up, out. too, for me is, you know, I've been posting on my channel about qualitative eternal life, right, and trying to right. get that out there because it is taught in free grace. But, and one of them, you know, one of the main passages they use is Romans 2 uh, mm -hmm. about, you know, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing. And I'm, I'm now coming ar around to the idea that the eternal life there, that that isn't a hypothetical. Right. Know, as is taught, that that's actually a qualitative component. But I was challenged that if I take that view and I, I'm basically losing the concept of Romans, I'm, I'm abandoning the idea no, of the no. gospel distinction and I, that it's going to necessitate a crossless gospel. <laughs> because, because, I'm not I, in, because I'm losing the whole point of Romans, which is, hey, you need the law, you know, the things we talked about. No, that, that, that's, that's the whole point of Lutheranism. You know, that, that's all that is. That's a Lutheran reading of the book of Romans that has influenced Protestantism. It's not the only reading. They want to say that because what they're saying is you're if you take that view, you're leaning towards the Zayn Hodges view, which is about temporal wrath, and it's not about hell. And Zayn Hodges and Wilkin, of course, the most famous people in GS. Also, also Dr. Rene Lopez. So what they mean by the crossless gospel is they're saying you're siding with GS on this issue. Right. Well, they but you can they, agree with a GS interpretation. Was hey, if the issue is not sins, then why do we need to believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin? We don't have to believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. Okay, so when it's taught in the Bible, when it's we believe about in Jesus Christ for eternal life. Okay, so when it, and I don't know the scripture, but it talks about them preaching the forgiveness of sins. Are you? Do you think that's like experiential? That that's it's the new covenant it? language. This is the new covenant that I make with the house of Israel and Judah when I take away their sins. It's national temporal, and I think. I think that uh, now I think that what's his name? Anthony DeRosa is consistent in this. I don't think we, we should make arguments to say our personal sins have been forgiven past, present, future. I think we can only be forgiven of sins we haven't committed yet. And because it's not about salvation, it's about your fellowship. And so what that means is that uh, if you're talking about a passage where it mentions forgiveness of sins, well, you got to remember in in the uh, in Lazar's view of the atonement, it's manifold. There's three benefits that are included within that. There's a removal for the world. There's the benefit for the one that believes the gospel, and then there's the forgiveness of sins based on First John, of uh, First John. So whenever you say that that Christ died for the forgiveness of sins. That's true, but that doesn't mean it's positional forgiveness. It could be experiential forgiveness because the blessings still flow from the, the, the atonement. It's grounded. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's just a lot to wrap your head around. Cause well, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it needs to be challenged. It needs, you're yeah. asking good questions and I'm, and I'm doing my best to give you, you know, off the cuff answers to try mm -hmm. to reason within their system. I don't know. They got to work it out. You know, I don't know if Sean's ever going to write a book on it or whatever, but Lewis Bray Schaefer is the one that started the ball rolling in that direction. And uh, uh, there was no crossless gospel at that time. So you can't say it's it's logically tied to the crossless gospel. Say that one more time. Lewis Berry Chafer is the one that first talked about this. Let me share my screen so we can see what we're talking about. Oh, 
Come on, it's not. Do you responding. think believing in Jesus for the forgiveness, the phrase "believing in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins" is an experiential thing? To Quote do. the passage. Uh, okay, I'll look. I'll look while you continue. And we're spitballing right here. We're saying if this atonement theory is true, how does it affect these other doctrines and passages? We're not being dogmatic here. That was the whole reason I used this opportunity to do go with the atonement because I wanted to float the idea. Sean's not using it in his debates that I could see, but I did. I mean, why argue about individual sins and whether you got to repent of them and all that if you can just prove that individual sins don't send anybody to hell? You have no grounds for saying somebody can lose their salvation if that be the case. Okay, what about like Acts 2.38? That's... Repent, be baptized, no. and you shall receive the for the remission for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That passage is not positional. They already believe. Why do you think right before that it said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They're already convicted. They already believe the gospel about the Messiah. The repentance is because they're in covenant violation, and the repentance is what causes the forgiveness of sins not the baptism. So this is the covenant, new covenant language that's being said there. So even though the new covenant, you know, I, I currently don't hold to the single covenant Israel only view. I hold the view that the party of the new covenant is Israel, but the church benefits. Well, those are Israelites. Those are the faithful remnant Israelites that are responding and the church is beginning there. So it's a new thing, but the blessings still flow to the church. And so he's talking about sins that they're guilty of that no one else is guilty of. No one actually was part of the generation that actually crucified the Messiah and rejected the kingdom. But they were. They had specific sins that we don't have. You know, we could say, yeah, he died in our place. But uh, in, in Acts 3, he says, save yourself from this perverse generation. So it's talking about national temporal sins divine judgment discipline those type of things like that okay yeah the reason because it looks like hey you believe and then you get the holy ghost like that's something we would say applies to believers now but you're saying no this was a specific time with a right. specific sin that this specific group was committing and it's also a specific time of the holy ghost where you know they were receiving it at this time it wasn't always you believe and then you get it right away because there's a lot going on here with the start of the church and, and things like right that. yes and that's exactly. why you have believers who haven't received the holy ghost yet right which is not happening now now it's instantaneous right right okay yes so what about uh, acts 10 the same idea this one says to him give all the prophets witness that through his name who whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins yeah so right there he's quoting the prophets and, and and so we're talking about remission of sins. He's talking about something that was true in the Old Testament, okay, and that is true now. So I think that's talking about sins being transgression, covenant violation. And so what he's saying is that Gentiles can even have reconciliation. I got Wilkins' book, but I haven't read it yet. So I'm curious to see how they deal with those passages too. But – um. I think one thing they do, though, is they say, yeah, Christ's death allows us to have that third benefit of forgiveness of sins, but it's not positional. It's experiential. And it's temporal. But look at this quote. Schaefer says this, from this scripture, we may conclude that there is a twofold aspect of reconciliation. First, that which God have already wrought in Christ, by which he has thoroughly changed the relation of the whole world to himself so that he does not reckon their trespasses unto them. And second, a reconciliation for which we may plead and which must take place in the attitude of the unsaved individual through the revelation given to him in the gospel concerning the sacrifice of Christ. Salvation is made to depend upon such a personal response to this appeal from God. And so this is what Lazar says. Here are the two benefits. First, the unbelieving world gets the benefit of a changed relation to God and not having their trespasses imputed to them. 
According to Schaefer, this is not a potential benefit, but one the world presently enjoys because of the cross. Second, there is the benefit of salvation. Schaefer says the salvation is made to depend upon such a personal response to the appeal for reconciliation. In other words, the world does not get salvation. Only believers do. So the thing is, is if they try to say it leads to a cross's gospel, they say what well, Lewis Berry Schaefer held to this view, and it didn't lead to a cross's gospel. Well, that's just, I mean, that might just because, it, you know, it's being developed. It's, Right, yeah. They could say, well, it's a logical outworking. Yeah. Right. But if that, if it, if everything leads to the cross was gospel, then maybe the cross was gospel is true. That's why people need to poke holes into this atonement view. Because this atonement view has effects on everything. Like I argued either last night or in my debate, that repentance is not about individual sins. Not for salvation. If this atonement view is right. So what is Schaefer saying in the green? Salvation is made to depend upon such a personal response to this appeal. It isn't the appeal that it, the this it's this is Second Corinthians five. So the issue is it says God was in the world, God was in Christ reconciling the world to us, and therefore we beseech you, brethren, as ambassadors of the world, be reconciled to the world. So you got God was reconciled to the world, and now. Uh, one must be reconciled to Christ. So that's an evangelistic appeal. So this is sort of like an objective versus subjective reconciliation. I'll show you where Ryrie says something similar in his basic theology, which I don't even know if Lazar was aware of, but I knew about it because I read it uh, probably first around 2009. What's the citation from Lazar there? Where is that, a book? No, that's a blog. He doesn't have a, the book written yet. Now, keep in mind, both Chafer, uh, Rari and Chafer both held to unconditional election. Okay? And see, that's the, my problem. I'm like, how could I? I have to give up unconditional pre temporal election if I'm going to hold to this view of the atonement. Because otherwise, it would lead to universalism, is what I'm thinking. But, uh, so, let's see here. Well, people are going to burn my channel down, Taylor. <laughs> well, I'm just, I just, I want to ask, like, how do you, it seems, how do you even know you're positionally saved? What scripture would you go to? That's a good question. And I'll show you some of them in a minute. Um, and the reason I say that is in your debates, you use, and I think correctly, John 3, 16, and the, the reference to numbers, you know, about, and using that to show that you're saved at one moment in time. But it sounds like you actually might, you might abandon that as a positional passage. It, it would be very hard. I mean, I'm not, I don't think I'll abandon it, but I'll understand if others abandon it. I could see how they get there, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um, so listen to this. Reconciliation means a change of relation from hostility to harmony and peace between two parties. People can be reconciled to each other, and people have been reconciled to God. A need for reconciliation. Why? Because of sin, God and man are in relationship of hostility and enmity. Though this is not mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5, it's clear in Romans 5. We were enemies of God, verse 10. Does this refer to mankind's enmity toward God or to God's enmity towards man? The latter seems to be the sense. That is, God reckoned us to be his enemies. This is the sense of the same word in Romans eleven twenty eight, 28, where God is said to reckon the people of Israel his enemies. Paul's mention of God's wrath in 5, 9 supports the interpretation that the enemies were the object of his wrath. Our state of estrangement could not have been more serious, nor the need for a change of reconciliation more urgent. So he's got the need for reconciliation. Then he has okay, the real cause. Quick, real quick, Charles, can you scroll up? So he's saying because of sin... We we're enemies of God, but do you believe that in a post like for believers today? In, after, no, you know, because if, if you're born now and Jesus already paid the penalty of sin, how are you an enemy of God because of sin? Right, so, and it doesn't make sense. It does. No, I don't, and it doesn't make sense to say people before the cross were enemies of God. If you're talking about like that, but so, in your view. 
it's already been de- since been dealt with. So how are we enemies? Right, right. Well, it wasn't dealt with until the cross. Right. So um, that's why I'm, that's why I specified after the cross. Anyone born now? Right. Yeah, that's what enemies? I'm saying. I we're not enemies positionally, uh, uh, unless you say that because unbelievers are in the kingdom of darkness. They're in Satan's kingdom. Oh, but Ryrie would say they're enemies now, right? Anyone, you know? Yes, or- yes, he would. Okay, okay. But, but, but God, well, actually, no. What he's going to say here is God has been reconciled to the world, but the world needs to be reconciled to God. God Watch what he reconciled. says here. There are three main answers to this question. God is reconciled to man. Man is reconciled to God. Or both are reconciled to each other. I'll skip to the both are reconciled to each other. Uh, Leon Morris who holds that both man and God are reconciled carefully notes that when we say that God can be thought of reconciled to man that does not mean that with various imperfections he alters completely his attitude toward men rather it's our groping way of expressing our conviction that he reacts in the strongest possible way against sin in every shape and form and that comes under the condemnation accordingly But that's when reconciliation is affected, when peace is made between man and God. Then that condemnation is removed and God looks on man no longer as the object of his holy and righteous wrath, but as the object of his love and his blessing. Okay, so. So they're basically saying it was both. But look, he's quote, this is the issue. Let's go. Let's go look at Zane Hodges. So what was the point of that? The Just point so of that was to show you that both Schaefer and Ryrie both held to a, a dual aspect to reconciliation, that God had to be reconciled to the world, but unbelievers still need to be reconciled to God in some other sense. That was their way of saying that. When you when you say, like when I hear when I hear us being reconciled to God, it's like, we're at fault. We need to be reconciled. But how, why is that not the case on the other way around? How, what am I misunderstanding about reconciliation? Well, it's, think of it like this. Obviously what I mean by that is God's not at fault that he needs to, you know, um, adjust himself to be with right standing with man, obviously, but that's how I see it with us being reconciled to God. So what am I missing? Well, the issue is, is that God, all right, you're right. This unravels a lot of different things. But so the assumption is, is that the atonement was about wrath. Okay. And about satisfaction. And that God's wrath had to be appeased because he's at war with mankind. That's the assumption. That's the assumption. Okay. Okay. And and that's like, well, wait a minute. Uh, why it? Why is the world? And and you're right. I mean, these things need to be dealt with, and they they need to be challenged. the The problem is, let's just see if he even mentions the atonement in the book. The Day of Atonement, okay. Thus the Atonement of Lord Jesus Christ has completely removed the demands of God's law from consideration, as well as removing all of the forms of working as well. Right, Rary said the same thing. But you don't um, believe God's law was involved if we were talking about Mosaic law. Right, but this at this passage was talking about Mosaic law at that time. One benefit of the Atonement was there was a removal of the legalism, the, the traditions. Zane Hodges wrote the book on atonement. And I got to remember the name of it. Um, Well, let's do this. Let's pull up their commentary. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5 and see how they understand 2 Corinthians 5. 
All right, now all things, the new creation, are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Reconciliation means a person's enmity toward God is removed by Jesus' death on the cross. The believer would not have been part of a new creation in Christ except by means of reconciliation made possible by Christ's death on the cross. The believer has been given a ministry of reconciliation, just as the one who is confronted should comfort others. So that the one who is reconciled should take part in bringing others to reconciliation. Paul further explains the ministry as one that teaches that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not imputing or counting or reckoning their trespasses to them. Christ has taken mankind's sin on himself so that it would not be reckoned against him. Not only has God done this work, he has also committed to us the word of reconciliation. Paul says the believer has a responsibility to share the gospel with unbelievers so that they might be reconciled to God. And then this is where he so says what do you about, think about that right there? Five, it's, how, that comment on 519 you just read. I don't, you don't disagree you don't with that. The, the, but you don't but, think the imputation of their trespasses to them is... is right. Like no, is, you're, no, this is talking about the barrier. This is this would be talking about no one goes to hell because of sin. That's what that would be talking about. Okay. So it is positional, but it's positional for the unbeliever, you know, before the cross. So that's what I'm saying. No one goes because if God's not counting their trespass against them, how could somebody go to hell because of sin? But well, because it, that yeah, the argument would be that that imputation is not done unless you believe. But that's not what the text says. What yeah, Lazar the, does, but you're saying the text just makes a general statement that it's done. Yes, whether or not you believe in Christ, right? Because it life. says it says you be given, you've been reconciled, and then it says we am we plead with others to be reconciled to God. So what Lazar does in his presentation is he goes through the passages. I mean, I made this presentation based on this the ones that you mentioned. But if I could bring this up. He goes through the passages and said, what's the benefit? What's the beneficiary? And what's the condition? And see, in John 1, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. There's no condition mentioned there. It's a statement of fact. In 2 Corinthians 5.19, non-imputation of sins, there's no condition there. And then 1 John 2.2, 2, where he's the propitiation, not only for our sins, but also the whole world. There's no condition there. Okay, I see. Interesting. Um, but no, it, it will be interesting to see. I just wanted to get the stuff out there in the public because Sean Griff, a lot of people are going to see Sean Griffin's debate, you know, and they're going to see, okay, he's free grace and he gave this argument and it's going to get people at, at having to see. I, I, I don't know if I articulated Sean's uh, position correctly, but I think I did a pretty good job, you know. Um, so he's going to have to answer those questions. So I'm glad you're pressing this, you know. I have no problem with the other view of the atonement. I'm just trying to test this explanatory power. And this is why I told Mark, I'm like, man, this is a lot of moving pieces, you know. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of foreseeing that if, if I take Romans experiential as experiential and not about positional truth, I'm going to have to change. I'm going to have to change my view on the atonement as we're discussing more. I don't toward, think you know, so. Your... What, what makes you think you have to change your view of the atonement based on how you understand Romans? Well, because I thought Romans was d discussing why we need a savior. Why? No, we it's not. From our no, it's, right. it's not. So if it's, it's not, then, and, and being forgiven for our sins is not the issue as far as going to heaven, then, then yeah, I'm changing my view because I, I, I use that argumentation that, but that's not changing your view of the atonement. That's changing your view of Romans. Well, the atonement is Christ dying for our sins, right? 
Yeah. And and we need that to be saved. Right. But not because he did that, but because that makes him eligible to offer eternal life. Yes. And so that's a big distinction, right? Yes. Like that extra point. <laughs> Cuz it's not that you're denying the atonement, you're just saying that the atonement isn't exact isn't exactly what gives us eternal life, but it makes Jesus able to offer eternal life and that's the issue. Right, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that distinction needs to be that clarification should be added when you're discussing because it's I'm still like wrapping my head around that part. But, but you're right. I guess I'm not changing my view of the atonement. No, you're not. You're just changing your view about Romans. You're saying it's it uh it's yeah. So I'm not teaching the crossless gospel. I don't hold to the crossless gospel. Um but I am exploring the implications, you know, and if the atonement is in this way, does it lead automatically necessarily to a crossless gospel? Chris Morrison says he holds to the same view of the atonement that Lazar does, and he says it doesn't necessarily lead to the crossless gospel. He uh, he mentioned that the other day in the stream whenever he was, uh, uh, was it on here or was it on Praise the Channel? I don't remember. I was in the stream with Chris Morrison the other day. Maybe it was my channel. Um, so yeah, okay. people, people are working on it, you know, Prove the what about that column. Romans verse? You take that as positional, which one will be justified, will be glorified. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh. uh, you're talking about 828, right? Right. Yeah, I don't I don't take 828 as positional. So then we got to deal with 29. Because right? it's using it that way. If you for, don't believe that. Well, yeah, you're right. Uh it, that that's but I understand other people do. I mean, the thing is is that for whom he foreknew, I don't think that's referring to salvation. Uh, uh he also predestined. I don't think that's referring to salvation. That's just mark out beforehand. To become the image, you know, of his son, to be conformed to the image of his son. That's just the purpose or the intent that God wants to occur. Now, Philippians 3.21 talks about that uh will be confirmed to the likeness of his son, and that's referring to the glorified body. But yeah, uh do I I don't think that, that it's necessarily positional. I don't think that's the point. But a lot of what people do is they'll say, for whom he justified, these whom he also glorified, right? He don't mention sanctification there. And so what some people would do is they'll say glorified is a proleptic heiress. And they'll say that it, it's spoken of in the past tense, even though it hasn't happened yet, because God is certain that it's going to occur. Well, what if it's just positional glorification? What if the fact that God is indwelling in you, the Shekinah glory that's indwelling within you is, is united with your spirit now, or you're one in spirit in some type of sense, as other passages talk about. And what, and that's what we're talking about there. You know? So you're saying it could be he who he like vindicates experientially will be glorified experientially. Yeah, well, or ultimately in the sense of ruling and reigning, that's another option too. So it could be position, experiential, or ultimate. Okay. What's it? Well, the reason I say that is because Romans 8 is talking about the re waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. I'll go ahead and show Sean this. He probably already saw it in my debate prep. Um, i got to stop sharing my screen. All right, so look at this chart, Taylor. I don't know if you've ever seen this chart. So you got 2 Timothy 2.10 and 13. You got Romans 6, and you got Romans 8. So 2 Timothy 2.10 talks about eternal glory, okay? And, and it corresponds, you look at Romans 8, you got compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us, okay? 
Uh, it could also be revealed in us. I can't, I can't remember what the purpose, uh, not the preposition, what's going on there. Um, but I think revealed in us could be an option. Uh, look, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. So that's related to their glory. Hebrews says uh, that to bring many sons to glory. So glory, I don't think it's just talking about the glorified body. It's talking about ruling and reigning. That the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into freedom of the glory of the children of God. And then you have down here waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. So that's talking about the body aspect. Um, but then you go here. And this is where you really start seeing this. Second Timothy, this is a trustworthy statement for if we died with him, we will also live with them. And so this corresponds to statements for he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him. And so it's focusing on the positional that he died with this on the cross. And that's the basis for that. And then Romans 8. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwell in you. And so here's the passage about the endure and faithless, and you can see where they correspond to here. So uh, I I went all the way up to verse 25, but if I go further, let's go bring up 10:25. Um, come on, don't get bogged down here. I'm gonna leave Hebrews for now. <sighs> So are you saying that there's a sense in which all not all believers will be glorified? <laughs> well, this is this is the issue, right? And I've been talking to some of my professors about this, or at least one in particular, and some and I was thinking about writing a paper this semester about it. But uh so let's start at eight sixteen. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, heirs also. Then it says, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, or joint heirs with Christ. Then you have, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Well, if the fellow heirs is being modified with if indeed, then what you have is you have a positional inheritance. All believers are children and positional heirs of God, but not all believers are fellow heirs with Christ. The condition for being a fellow heir with Christ is to suffer with him, and the result is so that you may be glorified with him. With a, so this isn't glory like glorified body focus. It's glory mm -hmm. in the sense of having ruling and reigning with him. Mm -hmm. It's the reward for suffering. Okay. That, cause that's why it says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed within us. So this or, is or all not, like kingdom imagery. Yeah. What? Or not if you don't meet those conditions. That you right. won't have glory revealed in you. Right. And But another option, because 1 Corinthians 15 talks about different glories. Of the body, of the glorified body, then not all glorified bodies will have the same. And that's why I mentioned in the debate, you know, everybody gets a car, but not everybody's car is going to be souped up. You know, your body might be able to fly through walls and or float fly, and mine can only walk through walls or something. You know, there that's a possibility. So you think this glorification is potentially what's being talked about with with um whom he predestined. You know, that one that talks right yes. there, verse 30. Yes. So look, in the same way, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Because we're eagerly waiting for this, right? And the Spirit, for we do not know how to praise we should, but the Holy Spirit intercedes for us or groanings too deep to, for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Not everybody loves God to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, and the word foreknew is used in Romans 3, I think it is. Let's see if it mentions it here. Which is referring to, has God 
uh, cast off his people for he foreknew. I think it's in Romans 3. So it's talking about Israel. Let's go back. Uh, Mark knows this argument really well. And I don't remember it. Four new. I need to put an E in that. All right, so let's go back. Uh, or is it forward? Okay, look right here. 11.2. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what scripture says? So this language is referring to him knowing them in the sense of being in covenant with them. I don't think it's even a statement about salvation. So if we take that in eight, then we say, God, who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Well, what is his purpose? Service. Uh, for those whom he foreknew, in other words, elected for service, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So this would be where what's talking about believers being uh, for service. So that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And then he's the firstborn, and even that's rulership language. So and, firstborn is not regeneration. Uh-uh. Okay. He would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, what, I mean, it's it's related to the resurrection, though. But firstborn is used in Colossians 1. Uh, and I'm not keeping up with the comments right now. Forgive me, Kingdom of Context. I uh, but it says, for he's the image of the visible God, the firstborn of all creation. I take this as firstborn over creation. It's a genitive of subordination. And that a basis of that, because he's focusing on this, and he says that in all things that he might have the preeminence. Where is right, it? And Jesus, he didn't need regeneration. Okay. Right, yeah. right. So it, it's, it, but preeminence would be right there. But the reconciliation, the rec uh, the resurrection language, I think, comes from 1 Corinthians 15. Um, so Christ resurrected, and he got the prototype. And our bodies are going to be conformed to his, essentially, is the idea. So, yeah, I don't think Romans 8, um, and, you know, I'm not the only one. I think Kevin Thompson doesn't view Romans 8, of course, the way the Calvinists do. I mean, I can see how, you know, I have, I'm influenced by reform because they harp on the predestined and foreknew here. So they, you know, they mm -hmm. kind of set the table of where the discussion is as, as far as this being all positional. Right. But if it's talking about Israel and the covenants, because there's, you know, this go, I think this is alludes back to, I think it's Deuteronomy 8. Uh, Kingdom of Context knows the Old Testament very well as far as the passages and stuff. It's where he says uh, why God chose Israel. Let's uh, talk about the test. Uh... Is it Deuteronomy 7? It basically says you were not that great and awesome nation. Uh, you were small, you know, but God chose to set his love upon you. Um, yeah, here it is. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore with the fathers, well, that's the Abrahamic covenant, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. See, that's not even positional redemption there. That's experiential and temporal and national. Um, but so you see that's similar language to. Yeah. As far as foreknowing Israel, choosing Israel for purpose. Yes. Yeah. Love, yes. It's all about relationship yeah yeah 
And even Pharisee. this passage, uh, if God is for us, who could be against us? The focus of this passage, I, I don't think, is about salvation either. Right. It, you know, but yeah. All right. So you got it? I, yeah, I'm starting to see that. Yep. Okay. 